Welcome to Cars on Call. I am Gashin Rawlitz and automotive journalist Steve Schutz. I'm here with collector, car collector, connoisseur, historian Adam Hudson, and special sauce trauma surgeon Stefan Rand. What's with the <laughs> special sauce? Well, I, well, let's get into car spotting first. All right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I may have spotted a couple of cars, two cars we got to talk about. All right. I have my my beat button ready. Um, all right, I want to get into a little bit of news, then we're going to get on to uh, car spotting, as you said, and uh, a little bit of follow-up from stories we've done before. No, none of this, none of the follow-up involves the Felicity Ace, but um, we're going to move on quickly to trauma surgeon Stefan Moran's safety segment, and then Adams uh, has a really interesting conversation to start, and we'll get into it, but it's about car collecting. Uh, the pros and cons, the realities. Uh, again, as you know from our intro listeners, uh, Adams Hudson has owned and sold and bought over 100 uh, desirable collector cars. So he's going to talk about the reality of that. Uh, there's a lot to say there. And then hopefully we'll have time for, for this or that. And evidently, this, evidently the car in the background who didn't make the cut either, right? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so listeners background the currently changing background. Right, so, <laughs> so listeners, Adams has had this S2000 in his background. And when he got this car back in March, Steve and I made an over and under bet that we gave the car six months to last in the garage. And Adams, it's six months to the date, right? It's about six months to the date, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what about that car? Is it staying in there or what? I'm afraid the answer would be not a no. It is not. It um, it as predicted by my colleagues, it failed to um, spark enough interest or continued joy, and also as predicted, uh, life above seven thousand RPM is fun, but it's exhausting. Like I said, man, it's it's, it's that blonde at the fraternity mixer, man. It's fun down there on the floor, <laughs> and maybe later, but. The next day when you wake up and up, it's time to move on, man. You don't want to live with her. No, can't live with it. Yep. Yeah, I'm not surprised. All right. That's a one-night stand car. There'll be a, there'll, there'll be a follow-up on that topic in, in a future episode. Well, we're dying to hear it. And I think it's one of those cars, you, you know, to check the box, it's a good car to have. So. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of checking a box, uh, I just want to note something very quickly. We have talked ad nauseum at Porsche 911. I, this is not a Porsche 911. Uh, show. So I want to just say this very quickly, but September 12th, 1963, I was six months old and the world was introduced to the birth of the Porsche 911 called the 901 at that time. You can see in this picture, it says type 901. That is the Frankfurt Auto Show. And that's when this car was born. It's lasted 60 years. It's an absolute classic. Uh, we throw the word icon around. This is a true icon uh, I have one. Adams has had many, and and Stefan is going to own one at some point. So I'll just say that um, it has evolved. It has changed. It has become this very special car that's very desirable. Lots of different iterations, convertible, Targa, GT cars, uh, so many different options and variations. Uh, Adams, I think you pointed out that there's 26 or 28 types of 911 you can buy. I don't want to talk, spend too much time on this, but boy, you have to stop and say, Happy birthday, Porsche 911. Adams, you must have so many happy memories. Just say happy birthday to your to this car. Man, it is. A, yeah, and it, a, a, a good day to wish a happy birthday to to one of all of our favorite cars. And uh, not to go down memory road too, too far, memory lane. But when I was in college, um, 911s were rolling around and, you know, pretty sparse numbers. We didn't see many in, in our college town. And I happened upon one in... Brown, otherwise known as um, uh, can't give it away. Brown, uh, not the best color, but it was ten grand on the money, and I wow. bought that car. And I really, I felt like my life had been elevated. I'd been used to British cars, no disparaging to the British cars, but the Porsche just was an entirely different standard of everything. And I drove that car all over creation, and enjoyed it, and maybe had thirty or so nine eleven cents and. Happy birthday to probably my favorite single mark car. Yeah, I have to agree. Happy birthday to Porsche. And this isn't the favorite car I have not owned. 
that I want to own one day. Um, I've done the Porsche driving school. I'm going back this year. That's my way of driving a Porsche and enjoying it and not having ownership. Um, eventually my wife allowed me to have one, but I think like many wives, when the Porsche shows up, she's afraid she's going to get traded up as well. And, uh, so, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I remember back, you know, I drove a, um, well, back, I moved back to college. Jerry Kitchens had, dad had a 911 T and that wonderful feces brown color that yours was. Called C- sepia brown. Sepia. Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was feces. It, it, that brown. is exactly okay. what it was. <laughs> or feces and, metallic, whatever you prefer. And then Packy Mills had, he got the brand new SC in Guards Red with the tan biscuit interior. Absolutely love that car. And then I drove a 930 um, back in uh, 88, Steve-O, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Dayton, Ohio, one of the anesthesiologists had one. And that was the very first time we got on, um, what was that that two-lane, four-lane that runner in front of St. E's, uh, Ed, Mo, Edwin Moses Boulevard, from named after the runner. And that was the first time that he said, get on it, get on it. I floored it. That turbo kicked in. And it was like watching the Twilight Zone. I thought cars were accelerating towards me. And it was me. It, it, I had such I had never had that kind of acceleration. And it was just I was just completely blown away. And um, as Steve-O, you guys, I've been a Porsche fan forever and uh, I will own one one day. But right now there's a car ahead of it, but there'll be one eventually up at my shop. Yeah, my uh, my memory is uh, in the late 60s, my uh, late great uncle Peter. Peter Schutz, not related to the CEO, Peter Schutz, who saved the 9-11 in 1981. Uh, he would swing by and visit, and he was uh, he had a, a 9-11 S Targa, I think 68, and then prior to that, he had like a 66 912. Um, never forgot those cars. I thought they were so cool. Uh, got to ride in both, and I said, I'm going to have one of these one day, and now I do. Um, so happy birthday, Porsche 911. A couple follow-up things. Uh, we do have to get to um, car spotting, but a couple of follow-up things. I went by my uh, Ford dealer today and looked at the lot. And as we have been talking about since the show started, since the Bronco, the Ford Bronco went on sale, there has never been a Bronco just sitting there unsold. Today, there's four. So the pipeline has obviously filled. I'm very curious to see uh, at the end of the third quarter how Bronco sales compare with the Jeep Wrangler. And the second thing I want to follow up on is Adams, you said before we started taping, we get credit for this. I'm going to take credit. Stefan, we went (laughs) fucking crazy over this. BMW said about six months ago that they were going to install heated seats in their car and only turn them on. If you paid by the month, there was an outcry started by us. And uh, today, automotive, uh, yesterday, automotive news, automotive news said BMW is not going to do it. Take notice, other manufacturers. People are just not going to tolerate subscription services yet in automobiles. I think one day it will come, but as of now, forget it. Car prices are too high. Interest rates are too high. Loans are too far out. You can't go tacking on a subscription service right now. Um, and yeah, I'm glad I'm glad that they listened to us, Steve-O. <laughs> yeah. And it's it, it so muddies the definition of ownership that I think we touched on at the time. You go, you buy the car, but then you're leasing whether or not the seats will be hot or not. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. It's like, pick one. I mean, if you buy it, you get the options. Uh, yeah, uh, the subscription service possibly for performance upgrades could be a thing in the future. But let's just don't go quite as far as the heated seat. I wonder if they had subscription for the ball coolers as well. Um, <laughs> but they didn't yeah. say. <laughs> that would that, that would have really infuriated me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What you got for car spotting, Steve-O? Uh, I always have to just take a deep breath and say <laughs> they're known as ventilated seats dr moran so <laughs> and, and this very, particular car yeah. spotting does not have it oh so, man but they're ball uh, cooler sorry dude car spotting um i saw a really cool car and the reason i'm like i gotta talk about this this week guys is number one it's a cool car number two this is the hundredth birthday of bmw bmw launched in 1923 and of course, they became this wonderful brand that we all love, all three of us. 
uh, a little bit of a cheeky thing um, in one of the German magazines, probably a bunch of German magazines. Uh, Mercedes uh, said a happy 100th birthday to BMW, leaving unsaid the fact that when BMW was born, uh, Mercedes was over 30 years old. So wow. <laughs> a little bit wow. of a a little bit of a poke uh, from um, Mercedes. Um, I think I guess it's payback when Dieter Zeitsche, uh, a CEO, um, two CEOs again of Mercedes or two. Uh, no, I guess is one CEO ago when he retired. Uh, BMW had a cheeky ad where it showed him leaving in an S class, going to his house, and once he's retired, he drives out of his uh, his garage with a BMW i8. He said he's he said he's finally free. I thought that was pretty cheeky. So anyway, I saw a 1972 BMW 2002. I love what? that car. When I was in, uh, you know, we lived in Gahanna, Ohio, and I guess I was in seventh grade. And um, one of the teachers who was also one of the coaches, I can't remember what he coached, but he drove one of these work and everybody else had the Mustangs and the Camaros and the Firebirds. And he drove this car. And that's probably the very first BMW I had ever seen in America. Um, I'd seen them in France. And it was small back then, but it it just was way, way cool. I I, I love the style, the thin A, B and C pillars. Let's just get that picture up, red one great color and yeah i love this car they sold almost probably close to a million of these things um and lots of iterations but yeah i, I do love this car and that's a it's beautiful there's they're so taut they're just the perfect packaging i mean that's not a big car it's sitting there riding on 13 or 14 inch wheels i can't remember what those are they may be 13s but uh, those those look like uh, possibly some ATS uh, aftermarket wheels, which are fabulous looking. And Stefan referred to that that C pillar in the rear with that famous Hoffmeister kink they called it that they started putting in various designs just to it strengthened up that pillar, but it also looked kind of cool. It was sort of their their design language. I I basically put myself through school buying and selling two double twos. It was a wow. hot car in college. Everybody loved them. They were super approachable. Like Steph said, they were pretty quick. You know, for their day, you know, they were 110 horse or something like that. You could get a TII version with 140 horse or a turbo version that that was so cool because the turbo version had turbo written backwards across the front spoiler. So those who would see it. Oh, in the rear, yeah, I forgot you know, about that. Pull over, just get out of the way. And that might have been a slight overstatement of its its capability, but it was fantastic. The Motor completely filled up the engine compartment. The interior space was ideally laid out. It had a massive trunk. It had the coolest little toolkit that you'd unscrew from the trunk and it would lay down and have you, you know, handful of tools. And the visibility in this little car, and it doesn't look like a handler, that car handles fantastically. And you're sitting in there driving with that crazy little bus like steering wheel. And you can see 360 degrees around you. I mean, it's like driving a bar stool, um, but way more fun. What a wonderful, wonderful car. Yeah, the background on this is in the early 60s, BMW was really uh, floundering. And they put a lot of money and basically bet the company on a new type of vehicle that was a car that would handle. And it was a car for drivers. And it was called the new class, N-E-U. K L A S S E, and this was the end of the new class cars. Uh, it was succeeded by the 320i, the first uh, three series BMW. This 2002, I've never owned one. Adams absolutely love this car. By the way, most people are completely unaware that the first production turbocharged uh, car ever sold was the 2002 Turbo. It didn't sell very well, but it was the first yeah. one, and Saab and Porsche came later. Um, it was a very, very special car. And by the way, <laughs> it's worth saying, this is an old car, but it is aged. The design is aged so well. And let's let's give, and Stefan and I have talked about this, let's give some credit to David E. Davis Jr. in 1968. The first test of this car that he wrote, he said, turn your hymnals to page 2002. And then he went on to extol oh, the virtues wow, of this car. A, that's great. That's a good David line. David E. Davis. God rest his soul, listeners. He's a He was an automotive journalist he started automobile magazine and his book is thus spoke thus spoke david e davis it's a great read um I was highlights of his career and he was a 
he was a larger than life journalist and he raced cars as well early on uh, but good read and yeah, homage to david e. davis well bmw wouldn't be what it is today if it weren't for the right. 2002 and the new class and uh, i'll just say very quickly there's a whole new class of cars that bmw is introducing relatively soon they're calling it the new class again uh regrettably uh it's not a light sports car it's a it's a whole line of heavy electric cars um anyway i wish them i wish i guess i wish them well but um yeah let's move on to i'm giggling i'm like we're now moving on i got a car spot in my own man all right, um, go for it. Yeah. Before your Satan race, is, is this safety? the special sauce? This is our goodness <laughs> gracious, great balls of fire. Where are my ball coolers? Okay, here's here's so I want I spotted the latest in redneck trends in Alabama. Man, I saw the very first Porsche uh, oh. G3 RS. <laughs> Look away! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Look away! <laughs> So, uh, you listeners, uh, you, if you're not watching the show, so what I have here, I spotted this here down in Alabama. You know that redneck trend where you see them hanging a certain piece of male anatomy off the hitch. Well, this is, and you know how much I hate wings I on pickup trucks. They hang them on pickup trucks at the back, and it's called N U T Z uh, nuts. And you know, it was, uh, and I think that would be a, these giant wings on these cars are, you know, they're just extensions as well. And I think a perfect place to hang a little nut sack off of one of those things. So, this is, and then, you know, I, I don't want to, we, I don't want to just pick on Porsche, but I also did spot this. I mean, check out this Mustang GTD. <laughs> I feel you know, are watching. There's, there's a picture right of a Mustang GTD with the same little accoutrement <laughs> hanging off of the back fin. <laughs> <laughs> all right well if it's if it's, uh, if it's it porsche is. if it's porsche you pay an extra 500 dollars to have a body color <laughs> <laughs> all right let's hear about safety oh safety i gotta move on to something serious all right um, can we transition from that to safety <laughs> say, one i'm not sure i'm getting the oh bins so um so i mean yeah all right i gotta regroup myself here try to get serious this, <laughs> this may be quick and fast so um this was um, from Jeff Bank, Dr. Jeff Bank, one of Steve-O's partners. He, he and his uh, father are huge listeners, and Jeff Bank has been on the show. And when Jeff Bank picks up something he finds interesting, he sends it to us, and especially for me on safety. And this comes from uh, The Truth About Cars, where I published two different articles a long time ago with the great Bertel Schmidt. Um, this was by Matt Posky. And this was published on August 31st, and the title was Fat Cars, um, report reveals what we already know about vehicle weight. And I talked about this a while back, but I want to kind of go to this art. Um, I just want to bring this up again because I think it's a worthwhile topic because we're going to continue to see change in our statistics. I think the statistics, and we're going to see an overlap between uh, passenger cars and vehicles once again, even get larger. But we all know that, you know, EVs are larger. And not only have EVs gotten bigger, but all cars have gotten bigger. And every modern, modern vehicle today weighs about, they claimed about a thousand more pounds from the National Bureau of Economic Research than it did about a decade ago. So we know cars are going up. Why is that? LIDAR, radar, this, that, that cameras everywhere. And I talk about, you know, if you can sit in a Mustang today, like my Mustang, the door is about six inches to your left. That gives you room and a side impact, which um, have been all initiated in studies. So Vehicles have had to add a lot of weight and bulk and size to meet side crash statistics, offset crashes. So they've gotten bigger to be safer. Well, that's all fine and great if you've got a new car that is bigger and safer like all the other vehicles on the road. But if you're driving a 10-year-old vehicle that weighs 1,000 pounds or less, you're, the increased chance of fatality is about 47% by that 1,000 pounds. Now, let's talk about that. Uh, electric vehicle, the average weight of an electric vehicle versus the non-electric version is about 3,000 pounds, which is the price, the, I'm sorry, is the size and weight of a Toyota Corolla. So wow, as we see additional, increase, right? additional. additional weight, yes, wow, additional right. weight. Yeah, think about that. 47% of a 1,000 pounds. Yeah. Wow. And remember, momentum equals one times, momentum equals mass times velocity squared. Kinetic energy is one half 
and v squared as well. So it's the mass is a linear relationship. It's not a square like velocity is, but I think we'll still see a linear increase. I don't know to how much. You know, so we just can't blame the automotive manufacturers for this. You know, the CAFE standards under the Obama administration encouraged automotive industry to prioritize larger combustion vehicles because they got offsets the, with the larger vehicles. They didn't have to be have the high MPG of the lower cars. So as a result of a lot of things, including safety, cars have just gotten bigger. The companies make more money off of them. They cost them less with CAFE standards. Taxes tend to be less. If you've got a business, you can buy, a, what is it, Steve, over 5,000 pounds. 6,000 pounds of gross weight. 6,000 pounds. You can write it off your, you can write off your business expense. So there's all these loopholes that have pushed cars to become larger. Um, now, it, yeah, so the new cars are safer and you much, and the bigger your car is, the better you do in a crash, even if it's a single vehicle crash. We know that. So weight does not place you at a disadvantage. The only place weight can put you at a disadvantage is in a, um, if you have to make a evasive maneuver in a car that's not really designed that well, it's just a big, heavy car. It's not going to perform as well as a smaller, smaller car, but that's not where we really see all the crashes. Um, and really in EVs, it's, it's the battery is the primary problem of implementation, but to think about it, they really can't do a lot of EV because we've talked about how their skateboard technology. So they build this long, low platform wheels on each corner battery in the middle engines on the ends there's not a lot of area to move for lighter weight materials because they have to worry about safety with these batteries so they're basically you know they have ballistic proofing around them to help with fires and during crashes so they're very there's going to be very very little savings you can do in an electric vehicle to save weight especially because an electric vehicle without the noise of the intake the exhaust Every little tick, rattle, noise rubbing inside a, of an EV becomes noticeable, and the pass and, and occupants, you know, think it means cheap. So, because of the noise um, and noise issues inside of an electric vehicle, they can't really do a whole lot inside to save money as well. So, not it's going to be hard to save weight in electric vehicles until we can cut down on until battery technology increases, um, and then. I know that was a lot, but I'm going to pull up, I'm going to pull, give me just hold on with me here for my, I'm going to pull up a slide and I'll, I've shown this slide before. Um, let me share the screen. Here it is. So this is um, listeners. That, um, so this is, so you can pull up traffic safety facts, which are put out by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And I'm an automotive research nerd. So I love these research notes that come out. And this one was um, titled Passenger Vehicle Occupant Fatality Rates by Type and Size of Vehicle. So what I do is I get these ideas about why there's more deaths on the road. And then I go to the databases and kind of see if there's anything that kind of supports my claim. And um, I can't do, I don't know how to do a pointer on this screen, but I've got it. This is occupant fatality rate per 100,000 registered passenger vehicles by type of vehicle. And if you look at this, passenger vehicles is the top green line. And from about 1996 all the way down to the late 2000s, about 2010, we kept we saw a continued decrease in passenger vehicle deaths, along with other vehicles. And then after about 2010, starting 2011, especially 2012, there was an uptick in passenger car deaths, while the others continued to decrease. And this has been well theorized and well um, stated that it's because the registrations on passenger vehicles are down vans suvs and pickups have gone way up so now if you crash in a passenger car you are more likely to crash versus and strike a van suv or pickup than you now, were back stefan let me earlier. just when you say when you say uh vans suvs and pickups have gone way up you do not mean fatalities have gone up you mean the numbers of heavier vehicles yes, yes, have exactly. gone up yes, and yes, therefore right, right. There's more passenger vehicle deaths. Right. So re vehicle registrations, if you, you can just look at the road and see everything now is an SUV or pickup. So there's fewer cars on the road. So the cars that do remain on the road, if you think about it from the straight percentage standpoint, if they're in a multi-vehicle crash, they're more likely to be struck by a vehicle which weighs a lot more than you do and also doesn't have the same funnel impact area, which puts you at a great disadvantage. So um, just once again, another article in Truth About Cars picked up by Jeff Bank. And I think, you know, what I see in this, 
and I really appreciate Jeff sending this to me, sending this to me is, and I, I've mentioned this earlier that this curve that we see with passenger vehicles is only going to rise and it's going to rise big time because a passenger vehicle, so you take a Camry versus a Camry, but it's a Camry with a BEV, that can't, BEV Camry is going to weigh about 2,500 pounds more than the standard Camry. The standard Camry occupants are going to do very poorly compared to the BEV Camry occupants. Yeah, this is a so linebacker, a linebacker against a wide, a, a skinny wide receiver. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. And yeah. it's almost like the, the 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 as the sales and the weight of the vehicles goes up, so does the fatality rate of the lesser advantaged passenger car. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's a sort of an alarming statistic, you know, as someone who hates waving goodbye to the passenger car because, you know, the SUVs and the big old fat trucks that people rarely fill up even close to capacity or tow close to capacity are out there kind of just roaming the highways. And yeah, they're the, they're, like you said, the, they're, they're the linebacker uh, about to, about to just rail on, on the skinny split end. I think there's a um, demographic and, um, class uh aspect to this i think you know people when i was a kid everyone had a big car there weren't suvs really there were very few pickup trucks so you had either an old like plymouth and a new cadillac so as someone who was you know the butcher had an old plymouth uh the the, the rich lawyer had a had a cat a brand new cadillac but they were very similar in size now the lawyer has an escalade and the butcher has probably a 20 year old or a 15 year old accord it it there's there's a class aspect to it too if you have money you're more likely to have a rich or, or you're more likely to have a bev and you're more likely to have a truck or suv right never thought about that that's probably w within the next layer of statistics right yep all right well th something to think about is when we, you know as the um what we the changing environment of the vehicles on the road is going to markedly change these statistics. Yeah, Steph, thanks. I know we're about to move on here, but you know, as gross vehicle weight goes up, fuel economy goes down, does it not? I mean, is that almost a direct correlation? Right. And that's part of where the cafe standards promoted that for the manufacturers to maintain cafe standards. They exempted the large trucks, um, large trucks and SUVs. So that's why there are so many of them. If they had to maintain there would have been equality of the cafe standards. It didn't matter across the board. You don't get a break just because it's a truck. Um, mm -hmm. But the breaks they gave them such were that the manufacturers pumped out these large vehicles um, because because of the cafe standard laws. So that's, and if, that's you, if, 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 if we if we get the seven dollar a gallon gas in this country ever, uh, everything will change again. Yes, absolutely. It will be BEVs. And light duty vehicles, two thousand eight, all over again. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the the cars that sold uh, in the last gas crisis, which was 05, right, Hurricane Katrina, it was Corollas and uh, and Civics, small light uh, vehicles. So, anyway, mm -hmm. moving on, um, Adams, this is something you you got a topic in mind, and I love this topic because. Um, myself, I have not bought that many cars and I've never really bought a collector car, um, except a new car, which has now become kind of a collector car, but I've never really bought collector cars and it seems so cool and glamorous to me, but as you know, better than Stefan or, or I do, it's not all glamour. It's not all glamour. You know, and we talk about this a bit on the show and I have a super soft spot for collector cars just cause I've. Just been a fan for a while. And, you know, you, what you see on the auctions and, you you know, you see Barrett Jackson on television, it does look like glamour and high style. You've got people in there drinking their beer or their champagne, whatever they are, and they're looking at these cards under the lights. And there's 200, 500, 1,000 cars sometimes at these auctions. And it just really tickles people's fancy. And I think actually the televising of the auctions and the, uh, the huge explosion, like bring a trailer to the online auction and sites, uh, uh, cars and bids, et cetera, has really just sort of mainstream in the collectible car. So you've got folks who have this idea in their mind. They go, you know, golly, I'd love to have that fill in the blank car, something I remember from my youth. And they chase that car down. They, they, 
study it a bit. They finally have some money saved. They choose their platform to purchase the car and then they get the car and then they realize something that it's old it has old tech brakes it has old tech fuel system it has old tech safety standards it has old tech uh chassis and and uh, handling dynamics and the uh, the wipers are ineffective and the defroster doesn't work and you know it's just things about it you know and sure you can say oh you get a fully restored one well a fully restored car from 19 19- 85 is still 1985 technology. And so there's like now there's this this new, it used to be sort of an in-between, and now there's these polar opposites. People who chase the I've known playing doctors. Queen, oh, I've known playing doctors who at the breakfast table looked across at their wives and traded them up as well that realized that what they had <laughs> changed a little bit as well. <laughs> I'm still with my wife at 30 years. I'm just saying it. This this it's something some of the people out there may relate to. Precisely. And, and, and that th- you're saying they traded in on a, a a model with fewer miles. Yeah. Perhaps and some aftermarket and some aftermarket parts. Or the wife got the aftermarket parts to keep him happy. I don't know. Could be. Well, that's the perfect segue to the resto mod. <laughs> because the people who get these cars at home and go, man, it's old, they they may start reading online or talking to folks and they go, well, I could get some modern benefits out of this. I could get a resto mod. And of course, the pe- people who out there who are followers know what a resto mod is. But for those of you who don't, it's often taking a completely new power plant with all the modern electronics, a totally upgraded chassis, suspension and brake. Uh, totally upgraded interior, all the electronics and everything about the car acts new, but it looks old. And we have a wagging finger of d- discontent. No, no, no. Um, I just, I was kind of raising my hand. Before you get into the resto mod, Adams, I had a question because of those points you just raised to me seem so critically important. You get an old car and you have old tech. How much, and, and you've talked to many, many buyers, you've you've bought many cars, how many go to an auction, get that old car, and have disappointment versus how many get it and say, wow, it's exactly what I wanted. I'm so excited. That is a good question. I wish I knew a, a real statistical answer to that, but I will say that I have known lots of people who were, and it's kind of like the group distinction. If they're casual car people, sort of passively interested in automobiles. They chase down that old car. Those people are most likely to be disappointed quickly because they're not used to putting up with it. They're they're so used to everything being modern and push button and easy to live with. And sometimes old cars aren't. I would be on the farther end of the spectrum. I don't want to not have a complete round trip in my old car. I don't want it to break, but I don't mind playing with it, tinkering with it, changing it, uh, be, doing preventive maintenance. That's a little bit of my enjoyment of the hobby. I extract almost as much enjoyment turning a wrench or playing with something, but some people really that's anathema to the cause. So those people would be likely better suited with the resto mod. Yeah, I think Adams, you bring up a great point. I entered the old car market back in 1988, and I'll tell that story a little bit later on, but I think you bring up a great point that if you're going to enter the classic car market and get a true classic car, number one is, you know, make sure it's well vetted, but you need to be prepared to do some problem solving, turn some wrenches, going through catalogs, hitting the boards, figuring out, or if, you know, if you've got a ton of money, you can just call a mechanic. That's fine. But that's not typically where most people are when they enter the old car, you know, getting the classic car of their dreams. It's quite true. Exactly. And, you know, you have people who who they don't know what to expect and they they sort of have forgotten that time has moved on and they got super, super used to their newer car and the way it behaved. But I'd say there's probably five big areas that anybody out there like in the hunt for for an older car might want to consider. As potential problem areas or deficiencies, if, if you want to call it that, or something just to be prepared to, to put up with. And the first one would be just basic roadworthiness. Um, Tire technology has changed. Headlight technology has changed. Like I mentioned, the wipers and the defrost. You cannot believe how inadequate some older cars are in that department. 
Uh, the next would be safety upgrades, which I know Dr. Steph would appreciate. Uh, the first big safety upgrade would be his favorite, the ball cooler. The uh, <laughs> thought I'd throw that in there. I just wanted to say it. Uh, but actually, uh, seat belts, you know, older seat belts. I mean, you're not going to have pretensions. You pretensioners, you're likely not going to have airbags, just depending on what decade you pick. But, you know, you can buy modern seat belts for old cars. And that's a wonderful thing to, you know, shoulder harnesses, three point harnesses, true latching down. Um, almost every old car can do with the brake upgrade. You don't have to put up with front disc and rear drum. If you go back that old, you don't even have to put up with the tiny little drums, excuse me, discs of old. You can upgrade your brakes. And most any real collector is not going to discount a car because it's it's a little change because all these are reversible mods. Where people start getting into trouble is they overspend on something that's not reversible, and then you've ticked off both sides. The essential running gear stuff, uh, cooling systems, fuel and ignition systems, those Things have come light years from the days of old. Um, uh, I being the senior member of this panel, I've owned a bunch of 60s cars and they just love to overheat. Big block vets, Jaguar E-types, Pantera, the poster boy for overheating. I mean, those things just, you just can't believe how much it's changed. But Lo and behold, people have come up with aftermarket options, bigger radiators, more efficient fans, thermo-inclined fans, all sorts of ways to reroute the air. Um, speaking of air, the next would be comfort. Air conditioning of old, even in our beloved 911s, was just rotten up till about 1994, in the late 964 or 95. It was just terrible. I mean, you just can't believe how poor it was. Terrible rides. Modern bushings would do it for you. Modern shocks would do it for you. And the last would be drivability. And that just means some older cars. It's funny. You know, we, we talk about muscle cars and these fast little sports cars that we, we like. They're not really comfortable driving 80 miles an hour down the road with traffic between 60 and 80. Pick your number. But um, something like a TR6 that you think is a, a fun little car. You can't go 70 miles an hour consistently in that car. You have to have an overdrive or a fifth gear. And thankfully, a lot of the transmissions can be upgraded. A lot of rear ends can be upgraded. So you can get your old car and have a new car experience without ruining it. Adams, let me ask you a question about um, condition. Uh, I like all those points because those are all parts of the car that are critical that degrade. And you just need to be aware that, number one, they weren't great when they started. And number two, they go from not that great to worse with degradation. <laughs> My question is maybe address um, something that brings, that accelerates degradation, and that is the third owner syndrome. I know you know about this, but, you know, for a desirable car, take a 911, uh, the first owner is going to be a professional, somebody with money. That person has always wanted a 911. Maybe it's the fifth 911, whatever. But they maintain it. They have money to maintain it. They take care of it. The second buyer is somebody maybe a little bit lower on the on the financial totem pole, but same kind of uh, uh, fastidiousness and attention to detail, and they maintain that car. The third owner is the problem. And talk about that accelerating the degradation. That man, that that's a great observation. You know, it's funny. Today, actually, this day on my way home, I got a call from a. A uh, Porsche tech friend of mine, he's a master technician for Porsche for, for 30 years. He was on their national hotline when nobody could solve the problem. That's who they called. He was one of the four guys who fielded those calls. And he happens to live in Alabama. Well, he was calling because I've come across a car from another friend uh, that is for sale that the third owner, your guy, got the car. That car has been sitting uh, a Porsche 928 S4. It's a 1988 model. Been sitting in a field uh, with the cover on it, with the rotten cover on it, um, for about two years. Um, I'll, I'll give you the dichotomy here. When that car was new, it was about 80 grand. And the wealthiest man in our hometown, a um, gentleman named Red Blunt, one of Alabama's first billionaires, bought that car new. That car was maintained to the hilt. I don't know what 80 grand was in 1988, but it was probably along the order of $150,000 now. That car right now is $1,800. Mm. 
Yeah, because the third owner can afford to buy it, but cannot afford to maintain it. Correcto. Correcto. And so things do degrade. And so when you look at a, a really complicated car, and Steve, I'm making this point too long, but if you look at a a complex car, like a 928, or like a lot of the Euro sports cars, the technology that was frozen in time then did not really upgrade. It's harder to find parts for them. If you do, it's often from a specialty supplier, and you're going to pay through both nostrils to get them. And so the cheap third owner is just not going to fix that stuff. It's just going to languish or he's going to tape stuff together. And that's when you open up the trunk and you see spliced wires and a bunch of crap added to it. And then you're really hurting. You need to buy from somebody who's as crazy about that car as they are just crazy. Well, let's move on to Restomods because uh, that is a very active area of collecting. Uh, Joe Bezetta, who um, was a great guest from about a, about six weeks ago, he talked about this and he made the point that he said, if you go back and we've all, I think Stefan even made this point, don't meet your heroes, you'll be disappointed. Um, and Joe Bezetta made the point that if you can take out the old parts and put something in that doesn't wreck the car, in other words, you don't change anything in the car, you keep the old parts and you can put them back in, you end up with a better solution. It's a it's a modern package. And he talked specifically about suspension and brakes. Uh, which are safety oriented. So let's talk about more about this resto mod thing. Um, Stefan, for example, uh, Stefan, you can say you can tell us, but I mean, your Cobra is going to have a brand new engine. It's got brand new brakes. Yeah. So um, I've owned an old car before, and it was just it was a lot of work. And then you know the Cobra I'm having built, the block is fifty years old. You know, but everything else is brand new. Every part that turns inside is going to have Holly fuel, the Holly Sniper fuel injection in it. And it's um, the total ignitions electric. It's got electric pump. It's got upgraded brakes over the original. It has. It is way safer than the original. The way the frame has been built through the doors. There's big steel panels inside the doors. So all in all, you know, it is. You know, really, it is a resto rod. It is way safer. Any replica is safer than any original Cobra. That's for sure. Much st st um, stouter vehicle. But I'm well with you, and I. Think about old car ownership. Um, I had one a while back. And I liked the idea of everything new in this Cobra. And I looked at, you know, I looked at 67 fastback Mustang resto rods. And because I'd really love to have a fastback Mustang. But to get into a resto rod Mustang, they're, they're you're you're starting at 125000 for a real resto. I mean, that's a lot of cash. Um, you can get an earlier Mustang that's got a few upgrades, but then it's still got a lot of the old stuff. But to do full suspension, full frame uh, reinforcement, new motor, new air conditioning, new interior, you're, you're you know, for most good, well done Rustle rods, it's, the starting price is over 100000 which is a lot of cash. It is indeed, you know, it, but, it, but it, it shows the health of that market. And, it, and it's cool that you're kind of building, in a way, a new. You really are. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're 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 getting a new car built, but it's got all the the the, the vintage clues and throwbacks and the and the fun and the noise is like the old car. But the health of the resto mod market is just shown when you see, every now and then you'll see a two or three hundred thousand dollar resto mod pop up. At Barrett Jackson, this last January, uh, there were three of the Broncos that were over four hundred thousand. Now I don't know wow. that. To me, it crosses some imaginary line of I don't even want to use it at that at that level. But people do want their modern conveniences, and 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 I get it. You know, I I do think like within this conversation, semi complicated point to make. I feel like the next wave of collectors is going to be really looking at usability and approachability over Exotica and the one guy in their state who can tune the car. That's not appealing to this next. Uh, level of collector. Therefore, uh, the next gen Japanese market is probably going to keep getting healthier. Uh, I was going to say it's the JDM market is is the is where it's at next. There's so many aftermarket parts, people that work on those. And you're right, it's the JDM market is where it's moving. I think the American V8 will always be there because mm -hmm. it's just the, the legend of the American V8. Um, yep. You know, like I heard the other day, there, there's more Chevy small blocks than there are people in England. 
um, you know. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> Think a fun that. stat. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun stat. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, to me, the resto rod is very appealing. And um, yeah, because you've got new stuff, it's not going to break down. You walk out, you use it, you drive it, you park it. And it doesn't break down overnight or catch fire like an old Lucas Electronics English car. Yeah. 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 I, I grew up uh, in a historic home and uh, it was absolutely beautiful. And I hated every second. Uh, <laughs> things were breaking. It was drafty. It was uncomfortable. Uh, the heater would break down. Every, it seemed like everything would break down. The roof would leak, even though it was well-maintained. But it's just, it's an old structure. And I really hated it. And to this day, I've always uh, had a strong preference for new homes. Um, I don't, I, I drove a, an old 911 SC, you know, years ago, and it just seems so raw. I drove it in the, in the late nineties and it was probably a 79, 80. And it was so raw and I, I really didn't like it. And I said, no, and I, I just have a strong preference for new cars, but I did drive, uh, this is actually Joe Bazetta's, but, uh, a, a resto mod 911, which keeps the SC structure completely fixes it new suspension new brakes new interior new engine new transmission and it opened my eyes and i said you know something i'd love to have this car it is the old experience much much better yes absolutely yeah yeah I, I, amen to all that you said you know it's interesting though as we as, as we sort of delve into it and we're going to get into some of our picks here in a moment when you look at the market disparity, you know, the OEM, it used to be, oh, is that stock, you know, are the chalk marks on the frame like they did back in 1973? You know, are those tires the right one? And is the date code on the replica battery? Does it look authentic? And I'm telling you that that hyper, hyper, hyper originality is really starting to wane a little bit because of a lot of the points we're talking about. And you look at the new standard setters, not just what Joe Buzetta is going to be doing and has done with older 911s, but look at Singer. I mean, a Singer is, give or take, a million dollar car. You know, I mean, 600 grand might buy you a bargain Singer, but I mean, Lord knows. And that's a resto mod. It is taken to the nth degree and everything about it is is consider you know considered custom or, or special made like a like a suit would be but every single on that car has been fashioned and rethought and i think that they're the standard bearer of the resto mod i like that point and actually i think the reason singers are so popular is because as you just said the new wave of collectors they want to drive it they do not want to park this car in like a museum setting and look at it they want to drive it and there's no better uh I, I it's hard to find a better driving car than a singer 911 i've never driven one i would i would love to so all right stevan had the idea of uh let's pretend we're new collectors and we're going to start a new collection um let's talk about that stevan because we all have picks all right so we um so listeners i want to do i wanted to kind of i didn't want to do fantasy picks because this is i want you to think um realistically where you may be in your life and you, you figured you want to go into this so here's 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 the scenario you got a two-car garage you're living in suburbia somewhere um your wife keeps her spot but yours your car is going to go to the driveway when you get this collect your very first collector car your new your car to have fun with you got the 529 plans for the kids you got them covered the kids are doing well you're ahead on your 15-year mortgage um and you had a good year at the office. It may whatever you do. And you, you, your wife says, you know what? Yeah, go ahead and get that car. And you toss out. You say, honey, how about uh, 30000 maybe? And she says, yeah, okay. You know, so I think this is a realistic pick um, about how that, you know, how this could transpire for you. So we each thought of our three. Um, we, we three picked out one pick in the under thirty thousand dollar range. And uh, hey, Steve, why don't you go first? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up your picture here. Of, um, so let Steve go first. And well, I'm gonna we go. I'm gonna just mirror what Adam said at the beginning okay, of the yeah. of the segment, which is you tend to want to go back to a car that you had when you were younger, and you now that you have money and you can afford it, you want to go back. Uh, it's probably a not a practical car. And I was very fortunate. I got a used, actually quite cheap, 
um, 240Z. It was 1972 240Z in this color. And right. uh, describe the color for the listeners, Steve. It's bright orange, and it's yeah. it, it's it, it was faded orange when I got it, but it didn't matter. Uh, it has an inline six 2.4 liter, hence the name. And this car was so much fun to drive. Had a four speed manual transmission. And uh, it was just great. It's only a two seater, so it's not practical. There's no way you, you can't even have a dog, let alone kids. But oh my gosh, I had so much fun with that car. Um, had to part with it, but um, I'd love to have another one. And you can get a good one for right around 30000 What a gorgeous design. You know, again, have, I keep uh, mentioning my um, the, the college days. That car came out. Um, and and was very much on the used market by the time I went off, off to school and relative and expensive actually, but once again I was driving MGs and Triumphs and Austin Healys. I mean I don't think I ever had anything newer than ten years old when I was up there. I actually had a '67 Austin Healy Mark III three thousand, and a, uh, a a friend of mine bought an orange 240Z, a '72 model. And it was so it was it was the the new age come to life. It was fast. It was it was uh, better built. You could just tell all the switch gear worked. The air conditioning worked. It started every time uh, that that's just a landmark car. What a fantastic pick. And then the Japanese carried it on with the first generation Miata. The idea of, you know, beating the English at the game again. The, the Japanese were the first to beat. At a, at a tr- I mean, there were other Japanese cars that came out before this, but this was really the, one of the first mass market Japanese sports car that that did it better than the English and did it better than everybody else. And then the Miata came on after that. All right, Adams. My my pick is is shockingly a, a bit newer. I barely make the twenty uh, year threshold with that car, the BMW wow. M. Uh, I wish I were able to to stretch the price range to include the S54, uh, but that's the 52, uh, the pre-2001. So uh, when did they come out, Steve? Would that be 98 to 2000, or when did that car come out? I don't remember. 98 seems about right. And it's just, you know, they, you know, colloquially called the, the clown shoe, which is a hilarious name in reference to its sort of it originally ungainly profile, which people are like, oh, look at that car. How weird. That's a bizarre looking design. And now the tables have turned. It's a great looking car. It's got the radically wide fenders in the rear. It's got the 17 inch. Uh, what are those called? The row star or throwing star? No, what is that? What is that wheel? Is a something star alloy? Oh, the Japanese throwing star like Bruce Lee. Yeah. yeah. No, the throwing star was in the, the M5. The, uh, the, the early 90s M5 had the throwing, mid 90s M5. They called it the throwing star. This was called something different. Something and it may have star in the word, but nonetheless, and it's got that fantastic side vent. I mean, I just love the style that that's uh, reminiscent of the 507. And it's just, you know, it, it's got, you know, one of the best inline six cylinders ever, ever, ever made. And it's uh, it was a 240 horse in, in this version and then 330 horse in the next version, which is why everybody pays huge dough for those. But, you know, you can warm one of these up. So it, within my thirty thousand dollar price range, which will be, I could barely squeak into one. Uh, I would probably spend a little bit of money on the intake and maybe on the exhaust and call it a day. But that's also a car that can be used. You and your lovely, your partner, your passenger of choice, and luggage can go about anywhere in comfort in that car. Yeah, I've always loved this car. I, I, I don't think I could drive one or own one, but I really do like this car. Um, you know, this is, I've told the story previously. You may not have heard the story listeners, but my wife was, she said, I saw this car. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. She kind of described to me and she's described, said, did it look like a clown shoe? She goes, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, yeah. I said, I know exactly I that. what you saw. Yeah. I yeah. Got it. He was trying to describe as this short thing, kind of fat fenders, but it, it was like a hatchback, but it wasn't a hatchback, but it had two doors. I said, why don't you? And she's like, yes. <laughs> yeah. All good right, Stefan. That's a all great, right, great pick. pick. So, that's a great pick. Um, all right, I'm going to start with here. So I'm going to kind of go back to a little origin story here. So, <laughs> so I was driving. Laugh. 
Uh, yeah, so listeners, I just put up a picture of a 1960 Austin Healey bug eyed Sprite painted in 57 Corvette yellow. I was driving home as a, a resident on the neurosurgery service in Dayton, Ohio. I'd just been beaten up for months on call. And I was turning 30. And this thing was parked on the side of the road. No lie on, uh, what was it? Not Dorothy Lane, Far Hills Road, maybe in Dayton, Ohio, Steve-O. But parked uh, on I don't remember. Parked on the side of the road in front of the psychologist office with a for sale sign. I pulled over and bought that car on the spot. <laughs> yes, I wrote him a check <laughs> and made Ellen go back with me and got this car. Um, this was kind of a little bit of a resto ride. It had a 1275 with a synchronized transmission instead of the original Nemec, I think 900 cc. It had 900, plus yeah. one tires, had some spacers. Um, it was a blast to drive, but Ellen had to push that thing about three times after dinner <laughs> on a little country road. She had had it with that car, and uh, I ended up selling it after about three years of ownership. But I loved it, and um, I had a good time with that. So Stephon, I forgot our roots were identical in that car. Uh, really? I, I had a 1960 Bug Eyed Sprite, uh, British Red and Green with black. Uh, also had the 1275 motor punched up from the 948 or just a different motor. You know, it had the 1275 nice. and that car felt fast. Of course, it weighed about, you know, 1800 pounds sopping wet and and sopping wet it got because it had side curtains. And, you know, but it felt fast. It made fast noises. It handled like a little bitty roller skate. It's a lot of fun. Yes. So that leads me to my pick. Um, so. I'm going back to um, my origin story here. So the first podcast, we talk about our origins for oh, cars, what got us going on. Nice. So the, um, so my first two car memories, we came back from France in 63 or four, I can't remember, 64. And dad brought, had a Sunbeam Alpine. And mom, he bought mom a um, fastback Mustang with the three, with the long story on that. But so I have tremendous memories of driving around and dad's was white and he had the ox blood interior dog jumped out of the back one time chase another dog hit the pavement at 30 miles an hour doesn't work well <laughs> he couldn't get his legs going fast enough he rolled across the ground but he got up anyway so this this came across spring trailer sold for 25 grand in 2022 now this is a resto this is I would I would put this in the resto rod category so this is a guy who took a sun a regular sunbeam alpine and then converted it to look like and drop like a tiger. So he put a 289 in it. He put the right wheels on it. So it doesn't have the, you know, it is not a true tiger, but it's kind of a resto because you really would, the original Alpine was kind of anemic with this cylinder, mm -hmm. with its engine. So here, this is, this is to me, this is the beginning of, you know, a baby Cobra. This is, this is, you know, this falls along the line of a Cobra. And for me, to, uh, you know, 25 grand just a little over a year ago. What a car. Um, it has great little fins on the back. I'm going to see if I can roll down. There you go. Listen, um, for you looking, it had great little fins on the back. Just a beautiful little car. Um, and with the V8 in it, it would be an absolute blast. And I thought, whoever bought this car for 25 grand got a bargain. And I'm sure they absolutely are having a blast with this car. They're having more than 25 grand worth of fun every time they take it out. What yeah. a terrific pick. And they, uh, Sunbeam made a beautiful hard top and they're, they're, they're not rare. You see them quite a bit. That go My dad had a blue hard top, Adam. Is that right? Yep. You, that turn them into a four season car. And, you know, like Steph said, you can, you, you can tune them and play with them. You can go down to, to Napa and buy anything under the hood or in the transmission for that matter. And just, and there's actually a, a, a few Mustang parts on that. There's a there's a few other Ford parts up under the suspension and brakes. And what what a great pick! Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of jealous. That 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 <laughs> that's a great car. That is my favorite of all our picks. And I will say this: uh, for those in the know, you want to take this to Cars and Coffee, where it would dominate. Uh, this yeah. car would do so well at Cars and Coffee. And what you have to do is, in between the front seats, you have to put a shoe that has a phone in it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know why Maxwell Smart, smart. Um, that smart, uh, yeah, drove this car. Agent eighty six and Agent eighty uh, ninety nine. That's yeah. a, and, and and they they shoved that car. You know, um, 
uh, Lord Lord Roots got uh, Shelby to convert his first car to to, to turn a uh, Alpine into a Tiger, and he had to shove the motor so far back in the back that you you change the back two spark plugs through a hole in the firewall. Oh, I didn't wow. know. That. That's how they did it back then. And but gosh, you know, nowadays people know everything you can do to that car to make it better, make it handle better, stop better, go better, cool better. Love it. So this would be a classic car that would be super easy to maintain, would be a blast. And uh yeah, that's my pick. That's, that's the best pick. I can't believe how great that is. So <laughs> that's a good one. All righty. Well, we are out of time. Uh, Stefan, with the best pick, close us out. Hey, okay. listeners. Thanks uh, once again for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, on YouTube, I keep hearing people on YouTube to say to hit the bell or whatever that means on YouTube, like. And then if you're listening on a podcast, like, subscribe and all that. Tell your friends about us. Uh, send us comments, email, and uh, we'll catch you next week.